when the desert is empty of the laughing calls of its sons and daughters. I don't want my daughters to go to the city where they'll be far away. There is hardly a chance to see them again, and I, their mother, feel great pain. I want my children to remain nomads and to live in my world. I worried most about my daughters. My sons, I knew they would not be corrupted. But my daughters are going to a country which is not their own. They are women and can only be corrupted and ruined. And I want very much to see Anna again. If the girl leaves me and goes to another country, she will have children there. She will become useless to me and to herself. Anna went to Bamako, and I'm afraid that she will be lost in the city. My mother's never seen a city. She thinks that the city is only alive with dangers and disgrace. The day my mother would set foot in the city, she thinks she would enter a world she will never understand. She doesn't even want me to tell her about the city. But Ahmed and I have a good life here. And yet we look forward to seeing our family's tents again. In the city I have so many things. There is always enough water and food is readily available. For the mountain desert, on the other hand, I need little. But it has nothing to offer either. There is never enough water. The men must fetch it from far away, and that makes life hard. I was terribly afraid about Anna, a great fear which I cannot talk to anyone about. Since the children left for the cities, leaving me behind, I am full of fear that they could die there without my seeing them again.
A blind woman sitting down sees a great deal which a prancing young girl doesn't recognize. Since Anna fled to the city, I live in fear. But my joy when she visits me is greater than my fear after she left. <laughs> Your nomadic life is an uncertain life. When my father died, he left us only cattle, but it disappeared, and it is as if he had had nothing. If he had lived in the city, then we might have houses and cars now, and this wealth would have survived. And in the city, disasters never happen. Years ago, the rain swept away everything, young people and solid houses. The cities also fall victim to natural disasters. But here, the earth does not devour people. <laughs> <laughs> but here there are hyenas, lions and jackals which drag you away. You don't find those animals here anymore. They have migrated to near the cities. And in the cities, the people eat each other up. <laughs> When I left my mother, I was still very young and immature. That troubled my mother, and she could not imagine that I can ever be a good daughter. People were always coming to us and telling us how many feasts there were in Taman Rasset, and that it was very merry there. I heard that, and so I decided to run away secretly. I was about 18 at the time. I went as usual to wash clothes at the well and ran away straight from there. I really wanted to go to the city. I wanted to experience everything I'd heard about. I was really afraid when I left because I did not at all know what awaited me there. But I could console myself for I knew a lot of people in the city with whom I could stay. I had fun day and night. Even at midnight I wouldn't go to sleep yet. The first time I saw Anna was in Taman Rasset at one of our acquaintances. I met her right after my arrival. We did not know each other, but it felt as if I had known her for a long time. Why did you especially want to meet me? I wanted to meet you because you're a cousin of mine. Because my relatives are closer to me than all other people. I don't know if you remember my telling you that it was very difficult for me in this city where I have no cousins. And if I found one of my sisters, I would prefer her above all other women. Yes, but there were also other women. Of all of them, you chose me. Yes, but every man has his chosen one. I couldn't take my eyes off you. Even our Creator did not create all women equal. That's why I took you. After all, I couldn't take all of them. No, no. What was the true reason why you chose me? I decided in favor of you because in my heart I had chosen you to live together with you. The night I confessed that to you, you slammed the door in my face. I had understood you perfectly well. That night you already understood me. On the third day, I returned to you. You made tea for me in the courtyard, and you stayed with me until dusk. So that night you already had your plan in mind. Yes. Intentionally? 
Yes, really. When I married you, my mother was very pleased. Then when I had a son, it was incomparable for her. She sent me many messages. She wanted to see him, especially to see him smile in front of her. I decorated my eyes and went to the feast, to the tende. I stayed the whole night and sang. When the fun was over, I went back to the tent with the man I liked and we sat down. That is how I met my first husband. He had already loved me before and then we married. We had children and set up a household. We lived together until his death. The children stayed with me until my second marriage. At my first wedding, I was worth six cows. At my second, it was only five. I was older and already had children. That reduced my value. That is why there was one cow less. <laughs> Men like the women they can get. Men want many children. A man doesn't care about anything. Some men don't even manage to meet the needs of a single woman, much less those of two or more women. Some men's wealth allows them to have four or five women, but we women here don't tolerate polygamy. In reality, all men want to have many women. The men desired by women are those who love women very much because they know women and their wishes. When a woman gets divorced, she takes the tent and all the household items with her. Why does she leave the man without possessions? Because the tent belongs to her alone. After all, she brought it with her. But doesn't the husband also contribute things to the household? No, our men do not contribute anything to the household. The tents are our business. We made them. When you got divorced, what did you leave him? I gave him a mat, a cushion and two vessels. That is all. I was not afraid when we separated because I had the support of my children. I'm not a woman who needs men so much that I would have to fear divorce. Ah. <laughs>
ايوه كي كي استرها تتيت النكاده تاعك ولا تتابع ترها تتيت النكاده يا حضيره يا حلك يا مارك يا سلام يا شضره وين السندات والغنم انت الله يرضى هذه الدوره تفيق ليتون هذه وطن انت زوزه انت راه انت انا واش She should tell us why she left her husband. I didn't like being with him anymore. Fatima, answer. Tell us the reason. Because he isn't handsome enough? <laughs> I simply didn't love him anymore. Do you think you have the right to leave him? I don't know. Isn't he gallant or handsome enough? Are you leaving him because he's living in poverty due to the recent bad years? To me, poverty is no reason. If I love the man, then it doesn't even bother me if he has no dog. When a woman decides to leave her husband, then she says to him, I don't love you anymore and gets a divorce. I think one can understand this when love passes. The man who is not your destiny, you will eventually leave. So when you love him, be sure not to lose yourself. Now I'm asking you, among all the men, which do you prefer? Of course I know that. Above all, it's the handsome man, the man with taste, who does good deeds. Every woman who meets him feels that. We love the one who has lamis between his flesh and his skin. Ah, the pillow player. <laughs> yes. He who has lamis between his flesh and his skin has understood us. <laughs> If, for example, the habala is ugly and has no charm and no taste, is too tall and stooped as well, uh, but takes good care of you, then not even a fly can land on you, for he holds you in his arms. And when you wake up, he will ask you what was disturbing you in your sleep. He doesn't even need to have a dog. He must have what we were talking about before. This good treatment would have no spice if I had this face in front of me every morning. Spare me this sight. <laughs> he's punished simply because he's not beautiful. The hard thing about beauty is that you long for it but cannot get it. With a beautiful man I would even be willing to root around an anthill for food and to live poorly. I would bear all that. But the man who is not beautiful, he can even put me in a butter churn. Whatever he does will remain in vain. I will come out of this vessel and not bear a trace of fat on my body. So God preserve us. When we visit my mother, I'm glad that I've not forgotten the work of my sisters. We women make curd cheese, cheese and butter, and we alone decide how the milk is divided up. 
The milk gives us strength and the water is our life. The men must fetch water from far away. They bake the bread, tend the cattle and wander with the caravans. The women take care of the young camels, the calves and lambs, and the men do the milking and all the hard chores around. The women do the house alone. Soundlessly, the black camel carries the night into the camp. I dance in the flames, have tasted the juice of all dreams, and nothing has dampened my joy. Mothers, remain hard in your words, but soft in your hearts. Our language has no flaw. It makes us rich, for stories nourish young life. Woman, O oh memory of this world, keep the old Tifina. The secret of our writing in the sand, which none of the hot storms can blow away. I teach the children our old script, Tifina. Only we women teach the children reading and writing. The men have nothing to do with it. They do not understand the lessons. The Tifina script has existed since the world lives. I know from our tales that back when there was no paper, people sent each other a certain type of riddle as a message. When a man wanted to meet someone at a certain place and time, he made up a small story. Then the particular person understood immediately. <coughs> Today we write letters for our relatives in the city. The schools in the cities drive the children out of their minds. We don't send them there, otherwise you don't recognize them again. A person returning to us from school doesn't look at his people anymore. He becomes an infidel. He only eats, dresses, sleeps all the time. What do you do with such an individual? In my days, I was forced to go to school. Schooling requires a permanent residence, but nomadic life is very transient. When I started going to school, it was very difficult for me to leave my family. I couldn't imagine living in one place. The problem traumatized me more or less. I couldn't imagine a life without my mother and my family, whom I care a great deal for, but also without milk. I spent many years unable to adapt. My father enjoyed seeing me go to school, but my mother was absolutely against it. That's why she asked the marabou for advice, for him to make a certain gri-gri. This charm was supposed to limit my intelligence. There are marabou who promise parents to make their children deaf. 
I became neither simple-minded nor deaf, fortunately, and I continued to attend school. I can drink several liters of milk a day, more than two or three, and when I drink milk I feel very good. I can even do without grain and all the other foods for a long time. I can live on only milk for several months. Camel milk is much lighter than cow's milk. That is why it always keeps someone who drinks it in good shape. Not too fat, like people who drink cow's milk, but hardier. A lot is made from milk. For example, butter, cheese, cream, and lots of other things. At any rate, I can live on it alone for a long time with no problem. I'm sure I wouldn't be missing anything. So milk is a basic foodstuff and indispensable to the nomad. There are old people like my mother who cannot even imagine a diet without milk. To her it's unbelievable. She's stunned when she hears how in the city sometimes we can live entirely without milk. We have experienced terrible years, lean years without milk. We moved around constantly following our cattle until they became tired. Some animals died before we slit their throats. There were people who didn't have a single donkey left. Many tried to eat grasses and leaves off the bushes until finally there was nothing left. Others went to the milk of the Europeans, to that refugee tent camp of the Red Cross, you know. Some were saved there, the abandoned women, children. Whoever stayed here was without hope. My husband brought milk made of white powder. When I mixed that stuff with water, the smell made me quite sick. The men went into the cities and sold things until they could find work of their own. When the trees became miserly, the sand strangled our tents. The women stayed behind in the drought. They live for the children, for the abandoned aged. The men, the cattle, the earth flee. Then, when the rainy season came, we only had ten goats left. We ate grasses until the animals finally had milk again. We milked them and stopped eating grasses. Despite the lean years, we still had something left. Our herds had died, but there were survivors which multiplied again. So there is always hope to build something up again. The cities do not have bad years. Whether there is a drought or not, they survive. They hardly notice it usually. Even in the fat years, when you have many camel mares, it can happen that the herd gets lost 
and you don't find a single mare, then suddenly you are poor. Losing your animals is a catastrophe which can happen to anyone. Then you simply go to friends and relatives and borrow some cattle. Exactly. You borrow a milk animal, living milk. If the neighbors have one, it is as if you had one yourself. Life simply goes on that way. This ancient mutual help is in our blood. In the city, nothing like that exists. <laughs> I am better off than you, happier than you. I have milk, I have meat, I have water. I slaughter kid goats, I make water bags. But you are more tired from this life in the bush. Even to make a water bag you have to collect bark, have to tan, sew, wash. A very laborious task. Only so you can drink. I have no problem with water. I have a tap in my house and can get water whenever I like. <laughs> with your tap in the city, not only does the water flow, but also your money flows away. Whereas when I go gathering, I only need my axe. I don't need money for my daily needs. Your water tap is money. The juice of your life is money. With you, everything is money. In the city, if you get up one morning with no money, then you fear you will lose your life before dusk. In the city, I get everything in one day. What do you get? You only find hard work. Every day, in the morning and evening, I follow my animals without great effort. In the evening, I go and milk them without any difficulty. The work of the herdswoman is too hard. I'm happier than you. No, I find everything myself. I need no one. In the past, people lived in affluence. They could really live well, had no problems. They lived from what they produced themselves. After the drought, they became poorer and poorer. And now they have to buy more and more products from elsewhere. They eat more grain than in the past. <laughs> We put the milk in here, and we drink from here. We warm ourselves with this blanket when it gets cold. With this ladle I scoop the milk from the bowl, and that is the dish we collect butter in. <laughs> we need this grain swing to clean our grain. The large grass mat is our protection against the wind and cold. We put the tea into the box. We put the salt and the medicines in there. Our butter sack is there. We make butter in it. That is the source for our food. Uh, 
Yes, this is what it looks like. We have our leather tent, the windscreen, the mortar, the milk pot, the tent poles, the large darned blanket which is stitched with needle and thread. That is all of our baggage. We need nothing more. We cannot live in one valley very long. Each month we move to the next watering hole. The grains we eat are millet, wheat, corn and rice. When the supply runs low, the men fetch more with our money. We get this from selling our kid goats, our lambs, our calves. The camels carry the grain and whoever has none uses his donkey. From tent to tent your trail drew me, the howling wind and the silent sand. I asked about you, but did not find you. The cities lure you men like a bewitchingly beautiful woman. My son flees, devours the fat rice of the cities. Your heart lives in the distance that hurts like the first birth. Your pride fell into a snake hole, but isn't obedience becoming to young blood? If the stones of Junan topple silently at the feet of the moon, my heart remains black as the rock and even sadder than the eyes of the gazelle as the hunter slaughters her. Even if sand, wind and stars dance, I could never laugh happily again, unless you, my son, return. <laughs> As a nomad, you are often alone. Your husband is gone for a long time, far away from you. During these times, you are very tired. You must take on all your husband's work as well. A husband who does not return from the city does not take care of his people. He flees from the responsibility. But a husband who returns has not forgotten his family. The one thinks only about his own head and the other fights for his people. And that is the best husband, that's certain. He leads the herds and brings water. He digs the wells in our way. He receives the guests. He is popular. He goes travelling and comes back with a loaded caravan. He is the family's support. But the husband in the city makes money. He sends you new things which are unknown to you. A husband who never stays with his family has no friends. He remains cut off from our world. You men have many faults. You let us get the water from the well, you let us bring it to the camp, you let us guard the animals. Some of you marry a woman, and when you've spent a couple of short nights or one or two years with her, then you disappear. You go traveling. You stay there in the city. You let the women suffer alone in the bush. Not at all. 
Don't we share the worries with you? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's your fault if we complain. It happens that a woman has to drag her she-ass to the well. You do not take away her burden and you give her nothing to drink and you disrespect her. Why do you complain when the morning finds me at your side? Your tender morning does not fight my hunger. Do you think I only need you when you take off your trousers outside the tent? <laughs> We are saddled with the worries and difficulties, but you go away and leave me here alone. I didn't leave without an aim, did I? I left to seek my fortune, in the bad years, far from the cities. Do you want me to stay with you? What are you saying? No, no. I want you to go get something and bring it back to me. Not for you to just go away and find your own fortune in that strange place. But you can feel how hard these years are, outside this tent. We all have experienced this hardship. I have too. I stayed here, didn't I? I took care of the ruins. <coughs> we can't act as we would like to. This world rules us. These changes which you women sense affect us men too. But we must not allow ourselves to be scattered in different directions. If we give up, we will never be the way we were before. No one will respect us anymore. We will lose our roots. If you cling to our roots until it has lost all meaning, how long will you wait while misery kills you in the shadow of dawn?